Hey guys, Bam here, and welcome, welcome, welcome to a new foe appears. The main man for the evening is none other than Coach Zeke. What is going on, brother? It's good to have you on the show. Yeah, it's nice to finally be on here. Yeah. We've been trying to get this done for a while, but it's nice to finally get to talk to you again. Yeah, man, definitely, absolutely. So, I mean, I want you to kind of, just for the viewers at home who maybe they just I haven't heard of you. They haven't. They don't know of the great work that you've been doing in the community. You know, just like elevating all these players out there. You know, t tell the viewers at home a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I'm Zeke. I am a full-time coach for Smash Four. What I do is a coaching service that is offered to anybody. A lot of people see coaching as a premium thing, and it just kind of comes down to the cost. You know, some people think it's like, oh, millions, millions, millions of dollars. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. not. It's really not. It's it's chump change. It's <laughs> yeah. really what it is. And so basically what I do is just teaching people, whether it's at the top level or people who bought the game a month ago, uh, understanding how to think, how to feel when they're playing, how to how to literally play, how to understand what they're seeing on the screen. Right. And um the whole nine yards. Some people, um, some coaches focus on like certain aspects of the game or certain characters even, but I, I do everything. Yeah. No, I, I love that, man. And I, I think that's something that always uh, excited me too because, you know, I've talked to, you know, my friends, uh, PG Zan uh, and mm -hmm. just a lot of other players. And I consistently heard a lot of great things about you and your coaching style. And I see kind of the things that you're interested in you're trying to break down the game mechanics, uh, see kind of uh, what's going on with the current meta, what should be applied, what, uh, you know, people should get, like try to mitigate uh, in terms of their, in their game plan. And I just see a lot of great things from you overall. So it's like, it, like I said before, man, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. And so I'm so glad to finally have you on deck. But I wanted to talk to you about Something that is kind of been a buzz right now in Smash 4, let's go into mid-set coaching. So a lot of people have been like, oh man, like this thing sucks, it should never exist. Some people, they think it's hype. Um, obviously with mid-set coaching, we kind of saw uh, a lot of uh, antics, I would say. Uh, given with, we had uh, Pierce yeah. obviously uh, being the coach of Zero. So he's kind of the one who really got the main uh, kind of spotlight when uh, coaching was kind of pushing the far away. And for better or for worse, a lot of people saw that and it seems like people just weren't really about it. Um, I remember at one point at Frostbite when uh, you had the crazy set between Sue and Zero, immediately afterwards, Sue was just like, yeah, I don't think coaching really should be a thing. I think that it uh, kind of belittle in terms of mid-set coaching. He felt like he, it belittles what people are doing, what people are working on. Uh, once you're on the stick, so to speak, it should be mono on mono, right? Unless you're playing dubs, of course. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to hear your thoughts about that because being someone who is a coach who's kind of made a livelihood through being a coach. Do you feel like this was the right move or do you think that people got this wrong? Do you think this is something should be revisited at a later time? What are your opinions? Um, I've been on the fence for it a very long time. Since the beginning, I loved getting to do it. It was very exciting. It was a good it was a good way to get exposure for myself. Being on stage at like Naira Saga and stuff, it was it was a great, great opportunity to have to be able to show that, like, hey, like I'm helping with this and like being part of it. But in the actual aspect of whether it's part of the game whether it's like regulated it's it's this huge gray area right so mm -hmm. right now the biggest thing is on the stage um there are some tournaments that even on on the main stage they're not regulating it properly whether it's time whether it's keeping the coaches not True. like the biggest thing that nobody's really talked about is um how many people are actually coaching somebody it's as simple as me sitting and talking to a couple other people and then going on yeah. the stage and it's the equivalent yeah. of four people coaching somebody and that's something nobody's talked about I mean, I did it in our talk. I didn't even think about it because it was just like I'm just sitting there and talking. And I was like, oh, wow, like I'm getting input from other people and like discussions and all that stuff. And it, it's just it's not one person coaching anymore. And that unless there's a way to regulate that, that's not really a thing, like having them separate on the stage as well as um, off the stage um, with not having proper volunteers, with not having a, a real rule for how all this even works, even now that it's banned. Um, 
the rules are still this gray area where people get away with stuff and there's still penalties that just should be game losses or DQs. And it's just, it's, it's, it's silly right now. Um, I personally, I don't even like doing it. Yeah. I don't, I don't like having to try and t compress a billion things into 30 seconds. It's literally gone to the point where, um, what I'll do instead is just write, write notes for people and show them my notes instead, right. because the reality that nobody realizes and why, uh, Timeouts for reading notes is actually better. Uh, aside from being able to have someone literally live tell you what you're, what you're uh, not seeing, mm -hmm. if there's generic things that you need to read to, or like reminders, um, especially like higher level sometimes, it's just like those little reminders, whether it's mental game or all that stuff, uh, you can read way faster than you can than you can talk. Right. Uh, and so you can get a lot more information by reading a piece of paper mm -hmm. than I can speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's kind of the big thing. Yeah, I mean, that, and that makes sense. I mean, I think I completely agree with you. From day one, when I saw Mid-Set coaching, I just remember people sitting around and like, and I even remember one time, I keep forgetting who the player was, but it was a situation where it was a top, like, top 50 player was playing and then a top 50 player was being a coach for someone. And only the guy was sitting there, he's like, I'm not really sure about this matchup. I don't even know why this guy picked me as to be their coach, but whatever. I'm going to rock it. I'm going to be their coach. And then, you know, obviously people sat around this person and said, well, you can do this. And stop. You know, you can do this in this yeah. matchup. You can do that. And before you know it, you go from it being one person in your corner to 50. And that, that yeah. is a very, very real thing. And I'm glad you brought it up because very few people actually discuss that portion of it. And it... Because some people mm -hmm. still think like, oh, well, what do you mean? How can this not be regulated? It's in other sports. It is in other sports. But it is, it comes down to regulations and it comes down to the fact that you need to have a appropriate foundation in order to make such things like this succeed. Because otherwise, like you said before, there's going to be problems. There's going to be issues that we're going to run into. And we yeah. saw it all day, every day, man. And it, it was very unfortunate. Now, I think it's really interesting to note as well is... I do feel in the public eye, for the most part, aside from, yes, you had, uh, you know, player coaches come up and do this stuff. But in terms of like a bona fide coach, the only, pe only person that people really saw was Pierce. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, um, some people, I know there's a lot of people really think he's very intelligent in terms of like certain aspects of the game. Uh, there's certain things that I personally disagree with some of the stuff that he does in coaching. Uh, I know some people like love it. What are your thoughts in terms of him being not so much maybe his actually like coaching skill, but more so how do you think he influenced, whether uh, positively or negatively, just how the whole dynamic of how people perceived coaching as a whole? Um... And be real here, man. So I'm gonna be real here, here, man. All yeah, right. Be, be, real. be real, I'm man. I'm going to preface what I'm going to say yeah. here with this is not in any way a will attack at Pierce. This right. is strictly my observation as well as my interactions with him over the years. True. I've never, like, been close with him, but having been um, mostly growing up in New Jersey and, and playing Smash in New Jersey for years since 2010, 2011, right. I've met him a lot of times. I've briefly interacted with him a lot of times as well as interacting with him in Smash 4 now, whether with coaching and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And he is a very outspoken person. True. And he is not willing to tell you that if he disagrees with you, that he thinks you're wrong. And uh, people are very offended by that. And that's a really big thing. And it's kind of just like he does his thing. And if you don't like his thing, then he doesn't care. And, you know, that's just my own personal observation. And, mm -hmm. like, I get it. Right. Um, but that kind of attitude has definitely formed a bit of a negative stigma for some other coaches. Right. Where people will be like, oh, like, that guy's getting a coach right now. Like... And they think that, like, a bunch of coaches are very, like, they put themselves, like, on a pedestal. Right. And the majority is, like, we're not. And and even, like, one of the big things um, that Pierce has definitely done, that even I learned this lesson, because I made this mistake for, like, the first year when I was coaching, is I refrain from using we. Ah, about now. <laughs> no. and, All right. <laughs> um. I think that is the biggest thing that has caused stigma. I mm -hmm. think when because he only p coaches one player, I definitely get the, the team, and I think that it creates a very positive thing that they work together, and True. that part of it is great. True. Um, one of the players that I've been teaching for almost the longest time is uh, Cosmos, mm -hmm. the uh, Corin, and even with him to this this point, I've never 
I, I've avoided from ever taking any credit or being part of it or anything like that. It's just like, you know, like we can work better so that you can succeed. Right. And that's the idea. It's not we succeed. It's you succeed with my help. I'm a resource. That is all I am. I am a resource that I supply information. I supply uh, psychological advice, whether what stuff about the game, whatever it is, matchups. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. But by no means am I the one holding the controller, telling you what buttons to press or anything like that. At the end of the day, you're the one making the choice to do that. And the one that feels the most pressure. I may be sitting in the crowd and freaking out and like getting all this anxiety from watching what happens. But I'm not the one that makes any of the decisions that occur throughout right. the entire sets. And so that's a really big thing that I, uh, I think that specific phrasing has caused a very negative stigma. Um for some coaches where if you see um, like me, uh, GSM Korean, who's Void's coach, mm -hmm. and Tony, who's uh, known for coaching a lot of players in Florida, like uh, Ridea, uh, who just beat Nairo at yeah. SmashCon. He coaches Dyer. He coaches Esam and MVD. Like he, he's another coach, like super on the come up. And he's like super background. He gives himself no exposure at all. He yeah. doesn't want it. And I totally respect it 100% because he's just doing his thing. And that's, right. that's great. But everybody um, has definitely universally agreed that um, that that's the best course. And I totally made that mistake for a very long time. I I referred to it like that, and and even then I had a negative stigma around me. A lot of people didn't like me for a while because of that, and mm -hmm. I learned from that a lot. Right, right, and yeah, I mean it's it's a definitely a major thing. Um, I've heard, I uh, actually had ran into a couple of friends when I was at SmashCon, and there's a lot of people who really felt that negative stigma when they heard that they immediately were turned off because at the end of the day as you said you are not the one up there holding the six you're not the one who's actually like doing the combat yep. you're not right you're in the corner and again even in like contact sports right you have a situation where people are like yeah you know uh we got this one for our team blah 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 you know but also at the same time if you see coaches are being referred to or talked to or um, in these kind of conversations, you know, they talk about, yeah, this guy's, you know, it's just great, you know, we try to work hard on these kind of things. And But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. the the victory, the win, you know, that is always, that is always told as for the player. This is what the player has done. You know, we sat together and tried to pull these resources to get them up to place so they can be able to do what they do. But at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to take the action and they're the ones who have to get the victory or take the L, depending on what happens, right? But that is mm -hmm. what's super it's, important. Um, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah, it's 100% up to the player to mm -hmm. give you any credit as a coach. It is up to them. Right. If, if they feel like you just were a resource and you just gave them information and like that's it, that's fine. But there's definitely been times where I've coached and a player's been like, I did so much better because of you. Thank you so much. And like they've explicitly told me like, I wouldn't have won that set if you didn't coach me, like stuff like that. I've gotten that and it's, it's great, but by no means I don't get to make that choice at all right right and no, i definitely agree with that and that's this kind of leads me into the next topic at hand i really wanted to talk about and that is just what you see coaching as overall because a lot of there are some people who really want to see coaching like mid-set coaching happen but i also think that people focus a little too much on mid-set coaching and aren't mm -hmm. nearly aware enough as about the other facets of coaching, the more important aspects of coaching that are really prevalent in our community. And so I want to hear from you yourself, like what do you think are, like what is on your priority list in terms of a coach? What are the things that you're trying to accomplish in terms, of the, in a general sense, to help your players out and just get these guys to, you know, be the, you know, be the best asset you can be for them and get them to the places that they're, they're trying to go to? So... The biggest thing is just preparation, whether it's for a tournament in general, and that can be um, a big thing that I personally focus on a lot is psychology, and that's like mindset. That's how you you cope with what's happening in the game. The game we play is very um, stressful. Is mm -hmm. definitely the key word. Yeah, it's very easy to get tilted. It's very easy to get caught by something very ridiculous if mm -hmm. you're not ready, and you have to be stable enough to cope with that. It's as simple as I mean, as we saw, like. You, you can lose a whole tournament by side being once at the wrong time. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that's the Evo killer right yeah. there. And that's the reality. And like being able to cope with that and keep going and like e e whether that's the last game or that's the first game is really, really important to like not let that like destroy you. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Um, 
stuff like that, as well as, um, you know, um, one of the big things I try to help with, especially for like the S tiers and the A tiers, is like pools. Uh, right now, we definitely have a problem with getting pools out early enough to actually, you know, do that. Yeah. <laughs> like pools come out two, three days before a tournament. Or like sometimes we get a week. So like SmashCon was a week early and then they were changing for four days. So I couldn't actually do anything. But a big thing is definitely like looking and being like, all right, because so many people are so good at this game now, you have to prepare for so many matchups, so many people, True. as well as like understanding um, just the, the the multitude of things that can come out of a single pool because four or five, six people can make it out of a pool sometimes now. And, and yeah. it's scary. And so you have to be ready to play three, four different people easily. And so um, it's a lot of preparation with that. Um, as well as if it's just, um, and that's usually for like the higher level players for like the mid level players, it's as simple as just like setting goals, um, preparing them, making themselves aware of their, of their habits so that they can go into, um, go into the tournament mindful and like mm -hmm. self-aware essentially is, is the really big key to improving. Um, but a lot of what I do essentially is just preparations, whether it's full on lessons where it's, I'm sitting with somebody and I'm, I'm teaching them concepts or we're watching through their sets together. Or even I offer like write-ups for people where I just, I on my own go and I watch their VODs and I write up their whole essays on like everything, four or five pages for like one eight minute set, like whatever it is. Some people, they need that much. Some people, they need one page of, of right. notes. It all depends on the person. And um, as well as like game plans, game plans are super important when you're going into a set and understanding like their bare bones, like whether it's matchup, whether it's how to deal with this kind of player, if someone's like hyper aggressive, whether someone's very passive aggressive and they're patient or, you know, if, you're, if there's a skill gap and you're like, OK, I have to be uh, mindful of that skill gap and, and take advantage of that as well as like if it whether you're on the negative end or, or the higher end, like it all depends. So there's a lot of a lot of little things to account for, but it's all pre-tournament 100 percent um is what i do like i don't even i don't even go to a lot of events i don't i don't really go to anything right. anymore uh, very often uh, every once in a while i'll go and like go to a local and have fun or like the occasional larger event um sometimes i'll get i'll fly out too mm -hmm. but i'll be at like shine this year uh in two weeks i'll be there but that's that's really it like because mid-site coaching isn't really a thing it's all all my work it consists of uh pre-tournament preparation yeah yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Definitely makes sense. I mean, that's going to be the really major thing you're going to be looking at overall, um, the pre-coaching. And mm -hmm. in terms, it's a lot of people just don't recognize that. They don't realize that these are kind of the yeah. major facets of what makes a coach, what truly makes a coach. And I do hope that um, whether through this video or just whatever people have seen, and just and obviously through you and all the other great coaches out there, because there's a ton of phenomenal coaches that people don't know about. Yep. And I think it's also a thing too, because sometimes people feel like there's a another stigma on the player side where if you need a coach, then there is something wrong with you. Yeah. Whereas it, which is to, in my opinion, just silly, especially in this day and age, because I think we're in a day and age now where it's not about who has all this information by themselves, right? We're in, we're in an age where, because we're in an information age, it's about someone who can take this information and sort through it the best. If you can sort through information roundly, then you can do well. Yep. And that's the kind of, that's the same, that concept is at the heart of like, you know, having a coach and have these people, because there's all these other assets, like you said, some, you're being a asset to someone, you are a, someone who should be used as a resource. And yeah. why not use all the resources you can and then take that information to be great, to create the best you, right? Why would I sit there and be like, oh, Duolingo's there. Maybe this can help me learn language. Nah, man, why am I doing that? I gotta be a real one. I gotta go straight to the country. Yes, do you, can you learn better straight going to the country? <laughs> of course you can. But you could also just go there and not know what you're doing and just get screwed and game over, right? And it's just like, yeah. these are the kind of things where people need to look at, where it is okay to take from someone and learn from someone. And it's a beautiful thing because it can allow you to become the best you. And I think that was what a coach is always trying to aim for, trying to help someone on their path to become the best version of themselves they can be. And I think that's a beautiful thing and that should be encouraged. So, you know, maybe we'll see uh, like mid-set coaching, maybe we'll return on under a different light, but I think the major thing that people should be looking at is not whether or not mid-set coaching is right or wrong, but they should actually really be assessing what is truly important in coaching. Because I think that more often than not, you'll find 
It's the prep work beforehand that really makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, like whether it's the training regimen you you use, like um, Tony, one of his big things that he teaches like training regimens, and he puts people on like the grind mm -hmm. where it's like two three hours sitting and watching like every little inch of a vod, whether it's sitting in muscle memorying out like one specific thing that you need to get down like it all comes down to the, the the person and like how they learn best and that's a really big thing um i definitely think the whole stigma of people being like oh like it's dumb to ask people for help or like even to at offering people help is something that people look down on to this day and that again um is a very grassroots thing mm -hmm. uh within this community absolutely uh, having somebody having been somebody who came from I started in FPS. I started in uh, competing in uh, Halo 2 and 3 MLG. Okay. And that was a team sport where so you had to teach other people. You had to interact with other people. And that was a very important part of it was the whole um, learning alongside your team and yeah. from the other team. Um, and when, um, when I had transitioned over to uh, Smash, the first thing I learned back in Brawl and PM and Melee was you have to figure stuff out. There's the bare bones information, how to wave dash, like bare bones, like this is kind of how a matchup works. Yeah. Um, but even little intricate things about matchups and like players and stuff like that, everyone kept it to themselves. Nobody really communicated. Yep. And I was very lucky to become friends with uh, False back in the day, him and uh, Exax and even like Nakat, like all the Leap of Faith guys, a lot of the guys in Tri-State, like they were so willing to teach and, and, and explain the game to somebody who only knew the bare basics and was like, basically a spectator because i didn't understand enough to, right. to execute enough mm -hmm. and that's something we need more of uh in this community for sure is people willing to teach and that's why we have so many channels now like iza where he has these full on uh almost like character ba like basic character guides or um my smash corner where he explains like in depth how a concept works right, or like right. how um a character's combos work and stuff like that and how to how to beat it how to not get hit by it how mm -hmm. how to do it yourself even like perfect pivoting, like stuff like that just wasn't around. And so it's definitely a really awesome, like you said, like age of information. You can spread information. You can take information. You can give information. You have the ability to do all of that on the internet now, which is awesome. And there's no reason to not do it. Um, people are definitely too afraid to ask questions. I, I think that it's a very like prideful thing. Yeah. And uh, everyone's got to just take their pride and put it in their pocket. Yeah. I think it's that time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. And yeah, I mean, we have so many resources now. Um, one, I always talk about uh, these guys over from uh, onesmash.net. They have that great database and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Like you said before, My Smash Corner. Uh, obviously, you have a Beefy Smash dudes. You have Iza. Uh, and obviously, you have some on the lower end of the scale. Those are kind of probably the most publicized content creators in that sense. But uh, you definitely have like Zan mm -hmm. makes stuff. Um, I used to make stuff back yep. in the day as well too. You have a load of other people who really have mm -hmm. been on the grind for this stuff a long time. And it's like, yeah, people should be just the same as watching a video, having a person sit down and talk with you and discuss these things. It's a beautiful thing and it helps elevate the entirety of the game. And I think that's something that people need to look at as well. And it's really exciting because it's like, who doesn't want to see people like play optimal and do like, you know, crazy conversion, do all these things. Yeah, right? Like that's hype. <laughs> like I want to see that, you know? I want to see crazy movement. I want that crisp movement, man. I, I love that. I'm always a sucker for that stuff. You know, we we're talking about the other day too, man. When we were playing, man. I just I, I just want to move and push buttons. That's what I love, dude. <laughs> that's what I'm about, man. Yeah. But um, yeah, dude, like I, I think that I'm hoping that more people get to that point and really try to push themselves in any way possible and use the people around them, you know, everyone working together to just better themselves. Um, that's probably one of the main things that we actually like out here as far as uh, 2GDC and just 2GD in general. Right now, of course, we're gonna have SCR Saga that's gonna be happening this weekend. And one of the my favorite things to see is when we have like kind of like character theme sagas and you have all these guys, they stay in the house together and they sit down and just seeing light bulbs going off, man. Going off over these guys' heads because yeah. like, well, I do this. Like, well, I've been using this. Oh, maybe we can do this together. Oh, wait, maybe this is actually the more optimal strat. And now people, now all of a sudden, all the reuse are doing it or all the Macs are doing it or all the Greninjas are doing it. And it's literally like a hyperbolic time chamber for these guys. And it's a beautiful thing that they're able to do that at the sagas, but I want to see that worldwide no matter what. What I want to see people at that level just moving forward and progressing, man. Um, but one quick thing I want to ask you about, we talked a little bit about before. I don't know if you want to talk about this. 
on right now on the video, but I want to talk about the seating for SmashCon. I want to now. You can talk about wherever you want to talk about it. It's up to you. But I, it's, it's honestly no, no, something that I'm I think. Totally down yes. To do it. Okay. Let's, so let's go, man. Tell me how you feel, cause I know you feel some type of way. So tell me about what you think about the seating. It's important because I think right now, especially where the game is at, seating is more important than ever before. And especially with a very balanced game, a very uh, huge diverse cast, I think not nearly enough people are looking at this and sometimes to be honest i think that these are some of the reasons as to why we have some like very like inconsistent results overall and so i think that th these are things that people need to actually be looking at so you know go ahead man so t tell, tell me about what's going on with SmashCon and the seating and what how you feel about it so the reality of the problem with seating at big tournaments is bias um there are not enough people being involved in helping with seating there's not a proper system for how we do it and people just have to suck it up and and, and get help and whether you pay for it i mean i've personally offered to help with seating and helping with stuff for free 100 percent. i'm totally down as somebody to spend 12 hours in one day and and fixing seating an entire s tier tournament just so it's a good tournament mm -hmm. instead of a bunch of complaints all weekend. Because especially with SmashCon, um, ha I, having uh, stayed at home, it was awful. It was awful to see that. I mean, another tournament where seating was butchered yeah. um, and they asked for help and they didn't take it was DreamHack. Uh, was it DreamHack Austin that you Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, they, they got their whole thing seated. And I'm not going to name names or anything like that, of course. But they got the seating from people. And then they were like, we don't like this. Oh, I think it was uh, Atlanta, like actually. I think it was Atlanta. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was one of them. It was, yeah. it was, I think it was Atlanta, yeah. And they just didn't use the seating. And then they didn't run their bracket correctly. They, they had people double, double eliminate each other, like Mystery and Fatality played twice. Like, that shouldn't happen. That actually should not have happened. And it, it, all it took was fixing one thing in Smash GG, and they wouldn't take anybody's help. Like, stuff like that. It's just unfortunate that in 2017, it's so easy to fix these problems. And it would have been something that nobody noticed if they just accepted help. And it, it's again, it's just pride. It's grassroots. It's all these all these issues put together where people just got to suck it up. And and whether you pay for it, whether it's people offering to help you. One of the big reasons why a lot of people come to me and ask for helping with seating is because I have over 250 students, almost 300 students in and outside of the U.S., Canada, yeah. Mexico. Mm -hmm. I have a player in the Middle East. I have player. I have a player in South Korea. Yeah. I, it, if a lot of people come to me and they're like, is this person good in their region? Or like, are they PR'd because there's not enough information out there? And even then, like head TOs, you guys gotta you gotta put effort into seating because you're gonna get pools of 12 people that can get out of a pool, and then you're gonna have pools with one person that's gonna get out and then bad players. Like, no shots at like, you know, it's a cool opportunity to have that, but there's a balance that we need to have to have a good tournament. And sure. if we don't do that correctly, when we have an age of resources with people having their PRs everywhere, with analysts in every single region of people who keep track of all this stuff, mm -hmm. there's no reason to not ask for help at all. And uh, I think that's the big thing is that you just need to hire people to to seed a tournament. That's yeah. it. And it's, it's as simple as instead of one or two people doing it and then someone's final say um, – you need to hire people like six to ten people, and that's their job. And we need to like, there's lots of issues with it. There's the signups need to be shut down earlier, and it's all about money. And like, I get that part of it. So it's there's so many things to weigh, and it's hard, man. But uh, I don't think we should ever have seating ever again, like SmashCon and DreamHack. Though that those were definitely the worst of the year that I can think of. Evo was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Evo did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head that really stood out. TGG's always been pretty good about it. I haven't mm -hmm. seen any issues. There's never been any like empty pools. And that's that's all that matters. As long as there isn't a pool of like why is there 14 randoms and two players that get out in this pool, but in this pool there's six people that can yeah. get out. Like that just shouldn't happen yeah. ever. No, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And uh, I think that uh for our side of coin, you know, it's, we're really grateful to have uh, PG Zen and then obviously uh, TLTC. Uh, mm -hmm. These guys have always been on yep. point where it comes to that, and they've actually been always willing to lend a helping hand. I know these guys have been talking mm -hmm. to some of the other TOs and stuff as well, and telling them like, "Hey, man, like 
this is how these things need to be seated. You need to be seating these amount of people, at least bare minimum. Yeah. Like you can't be, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna seat at like 30 and then afterwards everything else is just gonna be a crapshoot and I'm gonna do whatever. Like these are people who are, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's true because you have, it's not just the yeah. top 50, you have a lease of like a hundred, 150 people, like 200 people who are like super, super, super hungry and are really trying to make this, you know, trying to make it into the big leagues. And then from there, then you have a ton more who are really trying to be competitive and see how far they can grow. And when they're putting out their yep. this work, and you are not seating them properly, you are basically disenfranchising their, all the work and all the things they have done up to that point. Because that is what seating is. It's, it's their rank, you know? It's like you're taking away their rank yeah. and all the work they've done because you haven't put enough time and effort into what they're doing. And especially when people are flying to a lot of these major events, you know, not everyone is getting flown out. Not everyone has a sponsor. Even in Smash 4, where we're at right now, like we're still grassroots, you know, we're kind of in this awkward phase, right? We're like in this like adolescence, e like, you know, esports phase where everyone's not making this major money anyway. So it's some of these people, it's either A, they have to pay for their flights, or if their sponsor's paying for their flights, it's one out of the three they get in the year. So at the end of the day, it's something where people need to look at it and they need to hold us with high regard because it's unfair for some of these players. You know, it's a shame that we had some of these players, like if you look at Nairo's run, loses run at SmashCon, it was absolutely <laughs> insane. But it was partly insane yep. for the wrong reasons. Because you look at all these things and you're looking at all these players, it's like, what's going on here? Well, like, and then like all these, and then you look at other sides of the bracket, and then some guys just like off in their free pass and they're doing what and then nothing's wrong because you're having all these upsets happen, you're having all these issues happen simply because the seating is not being done correctly. Yeah, there's a lot of things, um, whether it's this is again no shots at anybody, but like lots of little things that have been issues. It's just communication. Um, I, the best way I can worry this is more competent volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to have a better system for who can volunteer. I love being having the opportunity where we can just be like, hey, who wants to run a pool? But you need to have somebody that knows what they're doing because there were pools that were fully reset at SmashCon, like from going all the way through to going back to round two of a pool and it taking an hour and a half longer and people having to replay, people getting DQ'd and then getting un would for no reason or like... There's a lot of things that went wrong. Yeah. And um, there's a, we, we definitely need to get out of grassroots and go, and not even, I'm not saying like go esports, not, none of that. Like we can't throw money, we can't do anything like crazy like that. Right. It's about being progressive. It's about getting to a point where we want to be better. Mm -hmm. If you're content with letting something get worse or stay bad, it's going to get worse because it's staying bad. Right. And that's what people don't understand. You have to constantly get better at something because everything else around you is getting better. It's just like getting better at Smash. Mm hmm. Everybody's working really hard. If you stop working hard and everyone else around you is working really hard, you might be stagnant in what you're doing, but everything else around you is rising up and you're just going to drop. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, a lot of people think that because people are afraid of change, sometimes they're like, oh, we're just going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. But you're never truly going to be able to stay the same because like you said, the environment is moving forward. And so that's something that you always have to be really cognizant of. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It's stuff that we need to really move forward on. And I'm sure you and I are going to have many more talks of these natures just for just because the people need to hear these things. And I know that people there's a lot of people who are intrigued about kind of the, you know, what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak, you know, with the seating, with the coaching, all these kind of things. And I think yep. that it's great to talk about this and give a, you know, have a platform for people to discuss these things. And most importantly, obviously the viewers at home so they can hear these things themselves and kind of, uh, you know, recognize what is going on in the scene they love and enjoy. I mean, otherwise you guys wouldn't be here watching. So again, man, yeah. <laughs> Zeke, my man, always a pleasure. And like I said, this is gonna be one of many. I'm gonna have you on really quick. Can you go ahead and shout out your socials to the people? Cause if you guys are looking for an amazing coach, you're looking for someone to kind of follow and just, you know, ask questions, someone who's really trying to be, you know, a, a servant to the community, so to speak. This man is definitely one of the main ones. So go ahead, man, let them know. Uh, my Twitter is at Zekeer, Z-E-K-E-H-E-R-E. -E -E. That is for my YouTube, my Twitch, my Twitter, 
everything is that basically. Um, if you ever have any questions, you're interested in coaching, um, I'm almost always open for signups. You're welcome to always DM me on Twitter, ask a question, all that stuff. Um, as well as I just want to give some shout outs to some people. Um, I want to shout out Cosmos, uh, Tweak, Locus, like some of the players I've been coaching on and off for a while mm -hmm. who have always just come back and, and proven and like even gone out of their way to tell people that like this guy is good. Like definitely check him out and then has suggested me to a lot of people and has given me a lot of opportunities. Right. As well as shout out to my girlfriend, Ash, who's been supporting me through this for the past almost two years now. And um just again, shout out to the other coaches who've been like super on the grind, who even I've been learning from and alongside. And that's right. um, Tony, uh, like I said, the coach from Florida, as well as a uh, Korean and another coach who's on the come up that a lot of people don't know about is his name is Corazon. He is a Bayonetta and Peach coach, mm -hmm. but this kid is actually like high key, a Bayonetta genius and knows a lot and can definitely teach just about anybody uh, how to play or how to beat this character. Yeah. And uh, I definitely recommend hitting him up if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, thank you again for having me on this show. I really appreciate it, man. Of course, man. Anytime, anytime. And like I said, this is one of many. Guys, I hope you guys enjoyed. Like I said, go ahead and check this man out. You know, give him a follow. Also, you know, if there's any tops, any kind of concerns, any, you know, anything you guys want to say about coaching, how you guys feel about it, you know, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, how can we elevate our game plan as a whole? Go ahead and leave those comments down below. Please like, follow, and subscribe. And most importantly, guys, have a damn good day. We'll see you guys soon.